Ok. Ben, je vais parler français puisque je suis catalan. I'm going to speak French because I, I, I'm Catalan, so it's normal that I should speak French. I'm going to talk to you about a second aspect of uh, space, which you saw with Didier. Uh, Didier is more extraterrestrial than I am because he's, he's long, he's very tall, so he gets more of the radiation than I do, like... And I'm going to talk to you about satellites in everyday life. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, uh, thank the Schiller Institute and the organizers uh, for bringing up this theme, which I find really interesting. I was a doctor, medical doctor, for uh, 15 years, a neuropsychiatrist, And after 15 years, I changed my life because I became a, an under-director at the uh, CNES, the National Center for the Space Studies. And uh, that I was at that job until I resigned last uh, July. And I want to talk to them about what satellites can bring to people. And what I'd like to talk to you about is a new paradigm for the services. See, this is not ET. Paradigm is a word in French which can be an a whole set of ideas which allow one to come up with an original idea, and I insist on the word original, and to actually realize them, innovation is absolutely essential. And innovation is one thing that has always guided me in my career, first as a doctor and then at the CNES. The ideas might be technological or methodological, humanist or whatever, but the ideas are coming from basic scientific research, such as DDA said for space exploration in the largest sense of the term, and it's scientific research which ends up in 95% of the cases, uh, these technologies, when applied, will Uh, increase the prosperity and well-being of the populations. My expose is in four different parts. First of all, why, why should we innovate in this domain of health and satellites? By taking two exam concrete examples. So why should we innovate? Then I take the research in uh, concrete examples on the environment, on the one hand, and another one which uh, affects all of us. And I'll tell you why uh, very shortly. And then I will make some conclusions and then make some remarks about innovation. Right now I'm, in, I'm retired, but I, I am a, still a consultant at the uh, Space Medicine faculty of Toulouse with the ESA and the uh, CNES, and uh, they work also on the, they worked on the Hermes project, which was then dropped for financial reasons. First of all, it's important to say that the world is changing, and I, I say this as a doctor. I'm not going to talk about the war danger and the energy question and so on and so forth, but just from the medical standpoint, uh, as a doctor who wants to help people, whatever the continent or the language, the world is changing and it will continue to change. On the medical level, populations are aging, are aging wherever you are, in Spain and Germany, wherever in the U.S., the population is getting older, so what is the immediate consequences? 
is that chronic diseases, um, which were not very frequent at all previously, were going to be doubled or even more, tripled, quadrupled. A recent study at the uh, health, French Health Ministry said that if we don't do anything, if the French government doesn't do anything, but this applies to all the European countries and even throughout the world, if nothing is done to fight against obesity, 25% of the population in Europe will be obese in 30, less than 30 years. And whoever talks about obesity means all of these chronic chronic diseases like diabetes. 6.2% of the Germans, 5% of the Chinese are have diabetes. So if you look at the the, the pharmacy business that's um, producing insulin is making a lot of money. Another factor of change are new social practices, something like tele, tele something or other and domotique, which means that you're working from home. Uh, you just have to uh, turn on a computer, you press a button, and the the work will be done for you by robots or whatever. So I become sedentary, sedentary. And then for, because of the crisis, and especially in Southern Europe, we have less and less money. So we need pragmatic approaches and practical approaches. We also have scientific and technological evolutions, in particular in communication, uh, either by Earth grounded or by satellites. We have the biosensors, we have biocaptors, and they provide new services and new careers, new types of uh, jobs. And on the medical level, in France and in Spain and in, Ger in Italy, we have we have less and less uh, doctors, less and less nurses, and this is going to be, become a really big problem. So it's necessary to to include these changes in all of our reflections on public health. And you'll see how space can help us in that. As new technologies, um, you'll see this more and more, and you'll read about that uh, at the TV news or whatever, in all the countries of the world, technologies that are being developed right now and getting uh, promising uses are robotic support, telesurgery, medical imagery. When he was studying in 1771 and he had a, a patient uh, who had a uh, stroke, I, did, I had no scanner. I didn't have any uh, imaging machines. How should I do a diagnostic? It was it was uh, really much, much less developed. And then, of course, information and communication technology have, has, have progressed a lot. And the, oh, they, they should be very promising for consultation uh, and interfering from a distance. You can have a personalized medical file, teleconsultation and tele-expertise, and in terms of monitoring, having your health monitored from home without having to move. So in five, six, ten years or whatever, in the, the health professionals um, who are interested in new technology and on how to transmit information, we want to see how 
see how the patient will have to go less and less often to the hospital, and the hospital will will come more to the people's home, to the patient's home, because there will be a whole panoply of um, of technological systems which will allow him to monitor his patient without actually seeing him in person. Now, for the satellites, well, it's like uh, it's like rockets. We don't have to uh, cover this up. Uh, the satellites are are first developed for military uses in general, but fortunately, uh, in these space agencies in the U.S., in Russia, in Europe, in France, and Germany, you have people who are rather humanist and who seek to find civil applications for these uh, satellite uses. The first satellite, satellite uh, communication satellite in France was called Asterix. It was built, uh, it was undercover on the order of uh, General de Gaulle because uh, some military leader had told him that uh, with such a satellite we would be able to uh, detect and transmit information very, very quickly. And this first satellite was a kind of prefigured what the ones that were to come later. Satellites for positioning and navigation were developed by by the uh, U.S. and the Defense Ministry. That was the first time that we saw uh, GPSs coming onto the market. And today, the mar- GPS market is uh, huge. I'll give you figures later. And the last type of satellite is uh, for observing the, the Earth. It was done at the request of the military to spy on the armies of other countries. And today they're used in different ways, uh, agriculture, energy. Uh, you can use it for it to green in the desert. Most f- satellites today are built for civil pur- civilian purposes, positioning or telecommunications. The annual market of services using satellites 100 percent, I'm talking about civilian markets here, we're not talking about armies or spying or whatever, it's 100 billion euros a year spent, 75 percent are brought in by communication satellites. So 75 billion are at 90 percent are for uh, televisions, uh, all the different channels. 23 percent, which is 23 billion, are from GPS and uh, and um, videos and all. Uh, banking exchanges, architecture, precision architecture, and so on. And only 2% are for Earth observation. So how can you explain such a difference? I have an explanation, which I experienced myself at the Kness. When we defined these satellites, they always had certain societal uses. Uh, to respond to uh, requests by specific groups such as uh, farmers uh, and who who needed to have, um, who understood why they could gain by having information from satellites. While for Earth observation, there are very, there are just um, 
a few agencies, specialized agencies, who had engineers who went out to do the imageries. And once these techniques were developed, they took them to different platforms, and then they were used. With uh, and we found these satellites up above us and <laughs> over our heads without really knowing too much why. In 1997. For the Kines, this Space Studies uh, Council, it was an important year because we had a minister, Mr. Claude Allegra, who was quite interested in the space. <coughs> he was very interested in mammoths, by the way, and elephants. And he asked the president of the Kines to answer the question. Can satellites help public health, yes or no? Please give me a report in six months. Now, so the uh, head of the Kness asked me as a doctor to uh, conduct the study. So I, th- I had two options. I could have taken engineers from ESA, from the Kness, from DLR, from the German agency, Um, There was not an Italian space agency at the time. Either I took those engineers or I took users. Uh, I mean, representatives of medical doctors, of surgeons, of nurses, of patients. Uh, And that's what I decided to do. I took them, I did the study with them, and they, um, they brought out four different fields of interest. Uh, on, on the one hand, you had uh, tele-epidemiology. And the others were simple uh, education, things like education or monitoring at home. And the first one, which I forgot to say, was teleconsultations. Now, the teleconsultation, that's what we call... Uh, health in remote areas. And what can uh, telecommunication satellites contribute to that? First of all, you have to understand what we mean by isolated areas. This means ge- geographically, like at the, at the end of the Amazon, the uh, backlands of um, behind Nice. It's really very, very isolated. If you want to do a, an emergency uh Echography, which is, uh, I think, a kind of, uh, I forget what you call it in English, sonography. It's not easy at all. It's difficult to get there. In French Guiana, uh, there are 250,000 inhabitants, and about 100,000 are located at two hours by helicopter from the nearest helicopter. And the same thing is true for the Amazon region. Then you also have the use after industrial disasters or post-natural disasters. You probably might have heard about the ADZAF factory in Toulouse, which exploded not so long ago, a chemical factory. 33 33 people died, which is not so much, but 37,000 people had to be hospitalized. And a whole area of Toulouse uh, had to be evacuated. And during the first two days after this disaster, uh, they said, they had to, the doctors had to be able to communicate between among themselves and also with the different hospitals. And um, they could do that thanks to these satellites because it was considered as, a, as an isolated area because of the disaster. So when we have communication satellites or positioning satellites, That's why Hugo Chavez, by the way, could escape um, 
seven or eight years ago when he was kidnapped by the CIA and the uh, Spanish authorities. But he had he had a GPS uh, system in his pocket, which his wife had given him as a present, and they f- therefore they could find out where he was. Then you have planes, boats, civilian or military expeditions for certain charter companies, for example, uh, you have 1,500 passengers on board with no military, uh, pers- uh, no medical personnel, excuse me. And if you ask, if you're in the plane, you ask if there's a, med- a doctor on board, he won't answer because of reasons of responsibility. Because on this model, on medical responsibility, are not very advanced. And as I said before, there's a lack of medical and paramedical professionals uh, depending on the regions, ge- geographical regions or, or other factors. Now, some tools we have here which were developed by space uh, studies. This idea was developed by Didier Schmidt. He didn't do it himself, but he gave the money for it. Now, this is a system here, which is is put onto the stomach of the patient. And the, um, the, the sound is going to be moved around by a joystick at a somewhere 1,000 kilometers away or whatever, but they're going to be able to see what that um, sound, uh, what's the word for it? Anyway, this medical exam. This is another product, which is a truck. And on top of that, there's an antenna, a satellite antenna, which can uh, transmit images and data from the place where that truck is located to hospitals. These are emergency tools. We said, what was the, what's the first thing that goes uh, during an emergency are the telecom- telecommunications. So these were developed for civilian protection. This uh, one you see here was used uh, in Haiti after the uh, earthquake. And there's also a smaller miniaturized one next to it. You can measure uh, cardiac uh, pressure and rates here, blood pressure and so on. Now this truck is called the Diabsat. It comes from diabetes and sat- satellite, Diabsat. Now, this is supposed to be used because in France and Spain and Italy and other countries, there are more and more diabetics. And in 90% of the cases, these people are not even aware of it. And they become aware of it only when a complication uh, manifests itself. For example, they become blind or a stroke or a heart attack, uh, to have kidney failure, to lose the sensibility in the uh, lower members and so on. And so in order to have the information of an an eye doctor, a kidney doctor, uh, and if you want to have an appointment with an eye doctor in Paris, at this point you have to wait about six months now. So what we did is we put all of the exams that correspond to these four different types of medical specialty 
and they are put into this uh, truck, and it's accompanied by a nurse who's going to go into the mountainous regions or in in an, the area around Marseille. And we began a, stu- a study three years ago and has uh, examined about 3,000 patients since then. And all of the structures, uh, responsible structures for public health on on, uh, on a regional level have ordered one to three of these different kind of trucks. So you see here a very good example of how these, the how the collection and transmission of satellites is used to save lives. And the cost of the four exams, together with the cost of the of the truck, together with the salary, salary of the nurse, this comes down, this only costs 150 euros uh, to, to take these 100, to take these four exams, so it's really nothing. The exams themselves don't cost even less, but the But, of course, if the patients have to travel to a specialized center to have the same test done, it will cost be much more expensive. So you have here, there's one test to to study the eyes, to study the sensibility, to to test the uh, kidneys. If this is not, this is screening uh, for diabetics. Um, this is uh, once there are complications. This is the kind of screening that's done. Before that, it would be almost impossible to test everybody. So we began this in October 2010, and it's supposed to end in December of this year. Until June of last year, we had um, 1,000 cases, let's say. More than uh, 3,000 tests were carried out. And what was very interesting is that uh, out of these 1,000 tests, we had about 240 people, which led to a hospitalization emergency hospitalization, which means that the person was becoming blind or or had a very uh, kidney dysfunctionment or or had an angina, which would have become worse, or a person who had a hole in his foot, which was an ulcer. So it was extremely beneficial. Now, here are the exact percentages of these uh, tests. The cost of um, of the van, not the truck, but the van, and the cost for functioning over 12 months. The other example I wanted to give you is concerns most the mosquitoology. And these are all the illnesses that are related to um, flying vectors, mosquitoes or birds. You should know that um, on the planet there are three billion people who are called the population at, at risk at risk of four different illnesses, hemorrhage, hemorrhaging fevers, paludism, that that makes two million deaths per year. It's enormous, two million uh, deaths a year, in particular for children, meningitis and cholera, cholera. These are called environmentally dependent diseases. They're, they are, They're in relation to environmental changes and, in particular, climatological climatological changes. 
by that I mean everything that's close to water, the temperature, the cleanliness, because all of these factors uh, promote mosquitoes. Somebody showed irrigation this morning, which was in from the Sina, Can, Suez Canal, I think, up to the Sinai. When those irrigations are have been operational, two two years later we had the uh, a fever which developed a special kind of fever, uh, which came from the the cows, the cattle from Sudan in particular, who went there. And they were there were the first Rift Valley fevers that appeared. So we artificially changed the environment, and these mosquitoes then appeared with their disease. Climate change. Well, um, in France, on the French continental territory, there was only one department which was considered at risk for illnesses related to mosquitoes. And the uh, official newspaper then printed four more departments at, at risk, uh, all in the south, southeast of France, where we see the premises emerging for future years of a subtropical climate with a multiplication of the vectors for mosquitoes. So what's associated with these epidemics? The world population is growing more and more. 50% of the population is exposed to diseases associated with climate changes. We have the reemergence of um, pathologies that are infectious. We have the paludismen and four to five million um, who are dying of paludism and other infectious diseases. Then we have the animal mortality and here we find the statistics on malaria, which is paludism, malaria. So that has a very important impact on health. So we put into place a certain kind of uh, uh, tele-epidemiology. Epi Don't look for it in the dictionary. You won't find that word, but it's means associating a certain number of data which are found on the ground in the city, in the department, in the region. And that data will be associated with data observed from satellites, Earth observation satellites, uh, on the level of the country or of the whole continent you can see what kind of vegetation there is, uh, whether there's climbing vegetation or, or not. And we take all of that data, we put it into a, a steam pot. A, we're going to make risk maps will be, um, will be produced electronically. They're going to be able to see what happened between the month of May 2012 and 2013. We can see what will the prob probability be of a Rift Valley epidemic or of malaria between here and there in Africa or this kind of thing. So these are very important means. You see here the Rift Valley fever uh, as it's monitored in Senegal. These are just brute images that you see here. And once they're treated, once they're processed, 
because to begin with, we only have figures, mathematical figures, about the human beings, about the vet veterinary uh, data, about the heights of the mountains or whatever. And then we come up with these maps. And we can say, okay, this here, uh, the, the zone, red zones, for example, are relatively, um, relatively high risk. The yellow zones are very low risk and so on. And we can furnish, provide the agencies with this information. Now, as concerned malaria, we're able to see, in the case of Dakar or other cities, we can see where the mosquitoes, the female mosquitoes, are going to predominate, and therefore they become high-risk zones. Here you see the example of Burkina Faso for malaria in rural zones. This type of approach took us about seven years to put into place because when I first went to see the head of the SPOT project, and I said, look, I think uh, the doctors would be interested to, in looking at the Earth observation satellite da data. I thought he was going to throw me out uh, thinking I was crazy or whatever. But no, he helped. So, and seven years later, we came up with a good system. And now we have uh, systems in South America, in Africa. We have four companies that were created who only do this kind of um, image processing. Some of them are small and medium-sized with seven to ten people. So it's a reality which will grow in the coming years. So in conclusion, I would say that the use of um, satellites to help medicine, at least in, in epidemics, in the field of epidemics or desertification of medical, desert, is a very good answer to the uh, World Health Organization and their recommendations uh, concerning public health problems in relation with the climatological changes. Otherwise, we have to try and transfer the knowledge uh, and the data to other French regions, to other countries, to other con continents. And we must not be obsessed with the price because the, the price of a telecommunication per satellite is is no longer $15 uh, for 15 seconds like they used to be many years ago. They're very, really quite low cost today. And we have to integrate these tools into the uh, healthcare systems. And we need to have patients because the patients are the ones who, who decide, uh, together with the doctors, of course, Now, my conclusion of the conclusion is that if we want to have a new paradigm in terms of societal research in space, we have to innovate. That is the key word. And in the health sector, it's even more key. If you're conservative, you don't want to innovate. Look what's happening today with Mr. Fillon and Mr. Copé and the conservative parties. But we have to want to change. We have to want to change in approach, uh, change the mentalities, uh, how, to, how to get people to understand that Iran is just a, this crisis is just an imposter. and who are pushing this line for reasons which are really not clear, which are suspect. And we have to have a utilitarian approach in that uh, we engineers, we satellite producers, 
the people from Polytechnique. Uh, these are not the people in their offices who should decide what kind of uh, things we need. It's the nurse who knows uh, what they need. It's the patients themselves, people who suffer from diabetics, diabetes. So we need an integrative approach. We didn't invent anything here. They all, all of these means existed before. We just had to integrate themselves into a, and we have something extraordinary in France and in Germany. We have the Airbus. It's a wonderful program. It's parts in Spain and in the UK. And we have two cities. Uh, Toulouse and a city in Germany where the, the production is going on, uh, where there's been a lot of development thanks to these, uh, this company. So we need to have revolutionary ideas. And the more an idea is revolutionary, the, the better chances it has to, to be adopted. We shouldn't be afraid to express such ideas. I come back to our specialist of the math, mammoths. He had about uh, 10 ideas per day. He saw 120 ideas per day and maybe one. Um, in a, there are others who have many, many more ideas, but his ideas were revolutionary, so they're good. And in the question of money, you have to ask for money not in order to satisfy the shareholders, but uh, in order to concretize certain systems and technologies. Now, if we look at all of these applications, and I add to health here everything that concerns security, resources, and agriculture, and so on and so forth, cars, health. In France, we created 47 small and medium-sized enterprises for this with about 1,200 people. And just about 1 billion euros of turnover per year. So if you try to citizenize, he made up this word, you citizenize the use of satellites, make them useful for the citizens, or to humanize them, we can do some very beautiful things. I thank you very much for your attention. Pardon. And especially, I forgot to say, <coughs> I want to uh, I don't want to be applauded, but I want you to say you should applaud the translators um, because I think they did an admirable job, and I thank you. Mesdames et Messieurs.